So, <laughs> so what you just saw was a musical Jagalbandi. We are <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to uh, do Kod Jagalbandi now. This time uh, we've been doing this. This is the fourth year of uh, Kod Jagalbandi. Uh, last year we explored uh, programming paradigms. This time we are going to explore uh, concurrency, and we have lined up three melodies. However, we only will be able to do two. So remaining the third one, which is everything is an event, is there on GitHub for you to see if you wanted to. So uh, let's uh, dive into the first melody straight. Uh, we have heard these terms, concurrency and parallelism. And we are now going to explore these terms and uh, try to delineate them. Yeah? It has been used synonymously, and so we just want to play this first melody to delineate the two terms. So for um, concurrency, we are going to use uh, a, a TCP server, a simple C TCP server, and uh, demonstrate that. And for parallelism, we have uh, another problem, which uh, determines the portfolio, net worth of a portfolio. Yeah? So let me launch uh, straight into uh, the problem. Yeah? So, uh, as you see here, this is this code is in Java. It's a simple server. Which yeah. Yeah. You want me to increase font? You can let the back. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, it creates a server socket. It starts out uh, in an infinite loop, waiting, uh, and, uh, waiting for a client to connect. And as you can see, the moment the client connects, it invokes uh, this particular uh, uh, method to uh, run the client. And as you can see here, um, we have uh, the moment the uh, client connects, we open up the uh, IO streams, and then we start reading. Um, in case, uh, if, if the server receives a quit from the client, the server then breaks out of this loop. So that's pretty much the standard server, uh, socket that we have. Uh, so I am going to uh, run this uh, piece of code. So we have our server waiting. Yeah. Now let me uh, fire up a telnet client and say hello it responds back, yeah? Uh, so this is one client connected. Uh, let us look how we can connect multiple other clients. So uh, I have over here with me a client class, which uh, makes a connection, yeah? Again, it opens up the IO streams and does a send receive uh, to the socket. And uh, whatever is being received later on is being print here, uh, pr printed here back so that the client sees. And finally, when it closes, it sends a quit signal to the server. Here's the main program. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm creating about four clients, each on a separate thread, yeah, as you can see here. And uh, after two seconds, so it sends a hello message and then sleeps for two seconds, yeah? So likewise, this happens for four times. So let's now run this client as well. What's happening? These guys are trying to send message, but this this guy, who is at the ticket at the check-in window, seems doesn't want to go away. And the client is these clients are stuck waiting for their turn to arrive. Yeah. Yeah. Checking in bags. Yeah, you're right. This this this, this bloody business customer <laughs> in the airline queue checking eight bags. Yeah. So what do we do? This is a useless server. So until this guy gets out, the others won't even get a chance. So now we can see each, each of the clients completing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is this of any use? What do you think? <laughs> this is a useless server, right? So we need to make it concurrent, right? So let's, let's look at how we can make this particular server concurrent. So let's go back here and make this server concurrent. Ideally, 
moment the uh, client connects, this is the code that gets executed. So we would, in traditional uh, Java world, we would spawn a thread, you know, a bare bone, raw thread at this point, and then handle the client on that thread. Here, I'm just going to use completable future, which is available uh, in Java, out of the box, and which does the same uh, job, essentially, and that's called run async. And in run async, uh, it requires a runnable, as you can see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shove in this piece of code in run async. And obviously, the uh, I need to wrap the exception because uh, handle new client, as you can see, throws IO exception. So I need to wrap this in, uh, in a try catch block here. And I am going to say IO exception. And as in all Java stuff, we gulp the exceptions. So I'm just going to gulp it. Let's start the server again. So uh, hang on, you're confident that that's thread same? Ah. <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> we have to worry the moment we spawn threads left and right in normal object-oriented programming, we have to. What's the mutable state? Well, luckily, uh, here I do not have any mutable state because I just am having a service socket. So this code will be thread safe. Yeah? Let's run the server. Now, it's waiting again as usual. I will start my telnet, say hello. And as you can see here, early on, earlier in the earlier code, it was serving each of them on the main thread. Here, it's using a worker thread out of a fork join pool. So now, if I run the clients again, all of them are able to, you know, so, so we have essentially created a few more check encounters at the airport. So Brahmaji, can you show me the code again? Ah, so as I see this, uh, you create one thread for every client, and every client runs on its own independent thread. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like multiple counters at the airport check encounter. Yeah. And uh, everyone gets a chance, a fair chance at, uh, at being served. Yes. Is that right? Is, yes, this is concurrency. Ah. Do you agree? Yeah. So, since we agree that was concurrency, let's now try to uh, look at an example which I think we will agree is, is parallel. So the task we've uh, constructed here is to compute the value of a portfolio. Make that a bit bigger. Ah, I run it. I intended to trace it because that lets us look at the code. So the task here is to compute the value of a portfolio. We have a portfolio where we, which we represent by a vector of codes. So those are the ticker codes of the stocks that we have. We type codes here in the session. We can see what that looks like. And we have a numeric vector of quantities, which is the number of shares that we have in each holding. We see Google is there twice. Maybe we purchased Google shares at two different times, different holdings. We might need that later for a tax computation. But now we just want to compute what is the net value of this. And the piece of information that's missing right now, of course, is the price of the code. And here we're using the each operator, that thing that looks like two claws at the top of the line, is map in other languages. We call it each in APL. And it applies get price, which is something that goes out to an HTTP server we have running locally to retrieve the price. So I'm going to invoke that. And that takes a little while. It did that. It returned seven prices. Price, yeah. Names are very important, and when you have some things with an S on the end and others that aren't, you confuse yourself. Um, and then the final step in the computation is, in APL, we can write this as the dot product or the vector product. We have two vectors. We need to multiply <coughs> corresponding elements, quantities and prices, and then sum them. And we can write that as plus dot times, so the price plus the times quantity 
returns the value. Now, the problem with this is that in APL, and I guess map in most languages, this thing is uh, sequential. Execute sequential. So the parallel version of this code, which looks like this, you can see it looks almost identical. There's one difference here, and that's that this, um, you notice I've replaced the each by capital I and then this French I with diaresis. The reason I have to do that is we're working on a model here at the moment. It's not fully implemented in the interpreter. So this construct here, parallel each, is covered by a model where we've used this name because it looks very similar to that. So what happens when I execute that is that it will invoke, it will create seven isolates, put the get price function inside. They are running in a pool of processes that do some wing threading. It will immediately return seven futures, and I can use that array of seven futures in the computation and do the calculation. So the difference between those two pieces of code is just inserting the parallel operator um, to invoke these codes in parallel. This is indeed interesting. Let me... And I hope you agree it's, this was a parallel <laughs> versus, versus concurrent. <laughs> so I can do something, pull off something similar in Java. Um, let's uh, look at portfolio equivalent. Again, I must admit it's quite verbose, but well, that's what it is. Yeah. So uh, let me first uh, show the non-parallel version. So essentially what I have, instead of your vectors, I have a map which holds uh, the stock holdings. The ticker is the key, and the, uh, the volume of shares is right here, is a, as, a, as a value. So when I run uh, this code, yeah, uh, it is going to calculate uh, so many stocks. And as you can see, uh, it is running sequentially because for everything, the main thread is being used. So it first does Microsoft, then gets Microsoft price, that get, goes for Google, Google fetches Google price back. So everything is done sequentially using just one single thread. I will turn this into parallel. Java Stream API provides a parallel switch, just like, it's not as parallel and but as sim, uh, notationally similar to yours, but hey, we do have this uh, parallel switch. And when I run this underneath, uh, the, uh, the Streams API will start the thread pool and unleash the threads and as you can see here, um, each worker thread picks up a particular piece of work of getting price. So you can see various different workers, seven, five, three, even main is now participating. Main doesn't sit, sit idle. This is work stealing uh, happening. Um, and then and we get the net worth. Um, is this really parallel? Well, this is parallel. No. So we have threads here, and we have threads elsewhere as well. What do you mean? Uh, let me show. this uh, small piece here, the start function, start method, and what if I say, You see what I've done here? I have created four copies of the socket, and I uh, invoke them in parallel. Each one of them uh, would, would call accept and handle client. So, is this parallel? Is this uh, concurrent? What is it? I'm confused. Well, <laughs> well, I think I think uh, just by using the word parallel doesn't mean that it becomes parallel. Mm -hmm. If you reflect deeply this is still concurrent. Uh, so, if I understand this right, what you're saying is, uh, in parallel, we are looking to 
utilize our entire available infrastructure or resources to complete a given common task which we split across those resources. And in concurrency, we uh, are looking to optimize availability or uh, responsiveness for consumers that come to us. It's like uh, you know having one customer hog four counters because he has eight packs to be checked in, so two per counter, which is not really a very uh, worldly scenario, uh, but we are from the other world anyway. And uh, versus having four counters serving different customers. Uh, is, is that a fair analogy? I think so, yeah. And uh, if you look, yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, concurrency means that you are really able to open another desk at a moment's notice. If somebody else shows up, you can always open another desk, and maybe even though the performance is slightly degraded, you will give them service. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that summarizes well, because goal of uh, parallelism is performance, and goal of concurrency is responsiveness. And I think both can coexist in the same system at the same time, because these are two different properties. Yeah? So I think that sums it up well. What do you think? Latency and throughput, is that the difference? It's about. Uh, not about latency, I think, latency, but uh, it's more about the ability to <coughs> serve despite you have load. So that's, that's responsiveness. Also, concurrency is at a higher level than parallelism in the sense that concurrency is modeling the independence of events? Yes, indeed. Uh, if, you, if you look in, in, in concurrency, each of these clients are served independently, oblivious of other clients existing. So that is concurrency. Whereas parallelism, what really happens is, you know, uh, you have a implicit synchronization point. You have to split the tasks, you have to, you have to do the work, and then gather the results yeah. back. So there is this implicit coordination point. Isn't it at the hardware level really that need to talk about We could talk about it at that level as well, but we can talk about it at a, at a code level as well. So in this example, uh, we have specified four topics for this software as a data for four and my processor has So underlying, there is this thread mechanism which uh, spawns the functions, correct? I mean, threads are spawned and functions are launched. That is completely separate from uh, what parallelism and concurrency is. This is the enabler for both, yeah? So that, these are really good questions. Maybe we can move to the next melody, yeah? In favor of time? Sure. So what is next? Um, yes. It is functional programming to the rescue, and typically in structures. So what do I mean by this? Well, we have uh, seen, uh, we, have, we have worried about, uh, really about, uh, when we render our code, and when we want to parallelize our code or make it concurrent, uh, the structure of the code changes very significantly, right? The structure of sequential code versus the structure of concurrent or parallel code is significantly different as compared to what we uh, anticipate. So we have to a priori think about how we go to code, right? So uh, uh, this particular melody, so there are two, two things here. There's something called as mutability as well. So we're not going to, going to go down the mutability route. That's, that's a melody by itself, where we talk about shared mutability, isolated mutability, and taming it. But, but yeah, so we'll, we'll focus, this particular melody focuses on structure of the, of the code, how it looks. And we have a very simple problem that we have tasked ourselves with. Um, we have a geographic, geography service, uh, and it has uh, it provides us with two information. Uh, a, uh, given a lap long, uh, it gives us weather of that particular place. And uh, given the lap long and the uh, radius, uh, say around 25 kilometers, it gives us the nearby places information. Yeah? So that's, that's what we have as a problem statement. Uh, so, um, Let's uh, look at how this particular code would be rendered sequentially, yeah? Just I'm using Scala at this point, it just happens to be that. Uh, this is just setting up the chores, uh, setting up the URL and all the stuff that is required. This is going to make the request, given a particular URL, return the result. And I'm going to invoke here this one after the other in sequential. As, as a sequence, and then collate the results, right? And then finally print it. So this is standard vanilla sequential code. So 
It's taking a long way. It's supposed to. It's gone. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> OK. All right, so let us make this con uh, parallel, right? And so that the main color thread is not you know, going to uh, get affected. So I'll now switch over to C sharp, uh, just, to, just to you know see the flavor. How we were doing these things way back uh, a few years ago, right? So again, this is chores. I won't go into the chores. The interesting bit here is I'm using a countdown latch as a synchronization point. Uh, what I have is at line number 17, I'm making a request. And uh, so it enters here. Um, and when this request comes in here, I put this request on a, on a thread pool thread, right? And I, and I ask it to run. So uh, the thread pool scheduler would schedule it, run it, and when the task completes, right, it si the latch signals back saying, all right, I'm done, so let's decrement the count by one. And then this, this guy would repeat the same, and until then, the main thread is going to wait. When the count reaches zero, it is going to become free and then execute these two lines. So let's, let's see this in action, I hope. Yeah. We got it faster, you agree? As, as opposed to before? Maybe it's not that noticeable. Half the time? Yeah, possibly. All right, so uh, I hope people have forgotten my Scala joke, and they've even forgotten the Scala example because the C sharp thing is here, and that allows me to make my next point. <laughs> this. So, is uh, isn't this code two word boss? Yes. This is right. Ah, thank you for the yes. <laughs> so. So uh, this is an example of the same solution in Clojure. And all of the uh, data setup ceremony is 23 lines, which is probably what you want to ignore. And we just move to 25 through 27. So what are we doing here? We have an inbuilt function, thankfully, called slurp. Uh, so slurp calls, uh, it takes an argument, which is a string, and that's generated by the weather URL function. Move it up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, ah, thank you. It's just the color. Oh, the interesting I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, that's sure. it. Yeah. Oh. See, I'm s So uh, back to this. Uh, so we simply compose uh, things in this nice fashion where we first generate the URL. We pass it on to Slurp. Slurp fetches it. But now we surround this inside of a future. And that future is going to return, future, of course, surprise, no surprise, of course, uh, weather and places. And line 33 now, which is which was 27 before, uh, is print info at weather at places. The at that you see is just the DRF operator. Uh, so you see that the amount of ceremony here is, is pretty low, right? There's still some small constructs that we need to be aware of, for example, especially the DRF. Uh, but on line 33, until those two futures have finished, uh, it's this, this program is going to block. And once it's done, it's going to consume. So you can see the amount of lack of ceremony, if I can put it that way. Here, uh, what does this look? Very beautiful. I think. Yeah. <laughs> but still too robust. But it's very nice to come uh, after the closure because it's very similar, in fact. The APL is going to be very similar. Uh, let's trace this so that, uh, same as the other solutions, there's five lines of code that are really uh, very uninteresting that create these, these two URLs that we're going to. So we're going to, we're making two web requests, right? And we want to do them simultaneously. And oops, this code is, was modified. <laughs> So what we're looking at here, uh, in the last run through, I modified this code to make it sequential. And the parallelism was taken out, and we didn't reset. So I'm going to make it uh, parallel again. Actually, it's good because it allows me to show you how to do that. So if this is sequential code. It's calling get request data, which is slurp. I love the name slurp. I'm going to adopt that. Uh, this is essentially the same as slurp. And if I just call that. Normally, it would just go out and get the text and put it in places nearby data. 
To make it parallel, I don't use the, the I followed by an I with diaresis because it's not an array. I don't need to combine parallel with map. I'm just making one single asynchronous or parallel. I mean, we call the name of this symbol in APL is parallel, and that's one of the interesting discussions, right? There's some confusion right there because I'm just making one call, right? But I'm going to make another one down here. So I'm going to call get request data again uh, in parallel with my main thread. Um, so if you look carefully now, I'm going to hit enter three times and execute the next three lines. And what you'll see is that line 10 and 11 finish instantaneously because I immediately get a future back. I don't need to say future because in APL, if you use the parallel operator, by default, you immediately get a future back. Um, and then line 12, where I construct some JSON, which assembles these two, uh, concatenating some strings together here to make a single JSON result, is going to block. So here we go. One, two, three. See, it's blocking there for about three seconds, I think. And then it finishes. So the only difference to the closure really is that there's no, it's implicit. In APL you can have implicitly arrays of future and the, uh, the interpreter blocks on them when it needs, when it executes a primitive that needs the value. So you can collect these things together into arrays, that doesn't require the value. But if you use the actual value, you block. So even a little bit less ceremony. I agree, that was nice. So, uh, but so far, whatever we've looked, uh, we've looked at kind of pulling the data, right? Let's turn this the other way around, where uh, when the when the worker thread is done, how about it says I'm done and it issues a callback, right? So we know from the JavaScript world they have dealt really well with the callback hells, right? They have promises to deal with the callback hell. So let's uh, let's look at the JavaScript code, uh, which is promisified now. Yeah. So essentially, I'm making a request, and I wrap this request in a promise. Yeah. And in promise, only two things can happen: either the promise can be can succeed, which in any case I result and return the result, or if some something goes wrong, um, I reject, I break the promise. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. And then I have this particular function, which is whether in nearby places I take consume two URLs create two promises, yeah, and pass them as an array to a promise.all. So what promise.all does is it waits for all the promises to complete, right? And when it's done successfully, it calls the then. Otherwise, if anything fails, it, there's a catch handler there. You can do various things with this, but yeah, uh, you could recover from there, a failure as well. But for now, this is the very simple one. And let's in, uh, run this now. Again, this is the ceremony part. And as you can see, this returns itself a promise. So I, 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 I have to consume the result I do then. So I'm just going to run this code. So now we got weather uh, using JavaScript. Okay? Now this, is, this particular code is, has you know, it's, it, promise in some sense is a monad, and it allows you to change the sequence of, com uh, sequence of computations using the then catch, then catch, then catch pipes. The structure of this code is pretty different from the sequential code, right? It is. We haven't yet reached that point uh, where the structure can be brought similar. So let's. So if you look at the sequential code early on, which we started with, and if you now look at this, this is still different. How can we still make it same? So languages like C Sharp, um, uh, Scala, for that matter of fact, uh, JavaScript have come up with what is uh, called as an async await construct, which actually the compiler underneath will generate all this boilerplate code. And it allows you to write, it allows you to think sequentially, but uh, write the code in parallel. So let's look at, since we said Go and Clojure have that. Really? Go has first class language support for it. Clojure gives it to you Coresing, via the yeah. Coresing library, yes. yes. Though they may not be direct, but you will have to use library. Okay. Go has it in built, in yes. Oh, yeah. okay. So let's look at the sequential code early on. This was the sequential code. I will, because it was done in Scala, we'll, we'll use Scala to 
to, to convert this sequential code into an async, uh, async await style code. So again, these are the chores, and I have some work that I'm doing, very important work. Uh, we'll come back to that. But if you look at, this is the crux here. If you look at the get request data, I'm wrapping this in an async block. Uh, if you look at the earlier one, the get request was not wrapped in an async block. Here, uh, it, is, it is wrapped in an async block. What it does is, it returns a future. It immediately starts when it is called. Uh, on a background thread, the thread, pools, uh, thread pool threads are not really visible to you because it's under this abstraction. And so what I do is, I create two futures, one for getting weather information, the other for getting places nearby. Yeah, and also, uh, uh, after I get the, uh, after I fire the futures, I want to wait, await, so you can see here a little await, which waits for the weather future. But because waiting is not good, so I wrap this back again in an async block. So now this code runs async. So, and, and, and like we talked about callbacks, this is the callback that gets registered. So when this future completes, I will get a callback while I can go ahead and do something important in the meanwhile. So let's see this, this in action, yeah. One, two, three, four, Sky. five, six. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> so you saw this doing important stuff appeared first, and then the uh, weather information and the, and the uh, places nearby information arrived. So this, this is, uh, you know, uh, now if you look at this code here for a while, the old sequential code, and if you look at the new code, which is parallel, we are getting there. Right? We simply have to write sequential code. We don't have to let go of our, our sequential thinking. Just wrap this in an async block, and you're done. That was a big one. But, uh, <laughs> uh, wow, that was quite a lot of things that we covered, I think. Right? Uh, we went through some sequential code, C-sharp, uh, then we converted that into... Uh, closure? New closure? Ah, of course, my favorite. Uh, and then uh, we saw uh, from the push style to the uh, from the pull style to the push style towards the end, right? So that's kind of an evolution. Um, so did, did did the audience also see that? Did the audience also see what the evolution looked like? Uh, maybe it's a good point right now to to hear what they have to say. What whether they have been sleeping or whether they have been aware of it all this while. Yeah. Let's let's yeah. let's open the floor for <laughs> let's open the floor for uh, joint reflection. Yeah? What do you guys think? Uh, we have mics here. Now we're not going to take it, take it. We're going to pass it to you. Yes. Yeah. Now, it makes it less scary because it doesn't have this word mona or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, so for a person who's coming from a uh, imperative style of programming, uh, it kind of annex. Uh, uh, really, uh, this kind of happened when I was using async await as a part of my JavaScript uh, project, and yeah, it was easy to get it. <coughs> so yeah, it's less crazy. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, async await. That was a good one. <laughs> So uh, maybe we can just have this joint reflection where we could start, we could uh, kickstart this uh, thing. So uh, if, if you uh, are old enough like us, then you must have seen how we move from processes, single processes to forking processes, right? And, and processes, forking processes are still considered okay. And uh, that was, after a while, people thought, oh, that's too heavy, right? creating processes and things. So we have threads. And threads were like the next beautiful thing, of course, uh, until they were not that beautiful, so they became heavy. And uh, they're the same threads. So uh, what we thought was, mm, why can't we reuse threads? Because well, threads can, are in the process, they can cooperate, they, they, they really share, they have trust uh, in built into this ecosystem. <coughs> so let's create thread pools. So we had thread pools. Uh, but we still couldn't, couldn't get rid of uh, mutexes, semaphores, uh, uh, latches, whatnot, right? Uh, so 
the functional style now really starts to uh, come in and start to shine. And we have this, of course, we've had it for a long time, but in, in just your academic papers, the persistent data structures, and uh, we now have immutability and immutable data structures coming in. We have some nice constructs, we have some nice compiler uh, level advances, which allow us to rewrite code and do, uh, you know, do our processing in terms of async, uh, but behind the scenes, maybe nice syntax, uh, uh, all of that, right? So you see that the evolution path has been pretty, uh, pretty nice, I would think, uh, if, if you really uh, go through the entire history. I would like to interject and say that if you look at this async await code, there is a problem here, if you can spot. And that has taken evolution even further, which, uh, which Eta has picked up on. Eta Lang, yeah. So the problem with async await here is this, that it, this is not composable. Though we have stepped again back into the paradigm of sequential uh, realm, uh, but still writing parallel, this is not composable. So Eta has what is called as uh, fiber monad to do exactly this. So this this gets com this gets you know uh, gone. This is gone. So async await. So that's the next evolution. What I hear is uh, Cat's library in Scala also has fiber, but I, I think Luca was here. He said this is not a still a monad, but you can still try this using Cat's library. So there is a fiber concept as well, uh, which is floating around. People maybe playing with that idea. What's the deal with the fiber? Ultimately, it's a cooperative unit of stability. Yes. Pretty yes. Right? Yes, and you have to yield inside. You have to yield, and and as soon as your runtime becomes capable of. Know, stepping in and figuring out that this is the point where a fiber yes, is so, locked. Yes, so that's where it's that kind of thing is taken uh, inside the monad. Okay. The monad sort of the yeah. yeah. Um, the one question that I had with respect to the example that you showed here yeah. uh, is that you know, you know, functional programming would have really shown if, uh, if you showed some sort of a, uh, you know, mutating behavior which you are avoiding because nothing is shared. And there is no mutability anymore. In this case, you know, I thought it was just uh, the fact that the abstraction does become more visible. Yes. Sure. Yes. So, so the path there's a there's a two two path, like I said. So uh, shared mutability, one needs to tame it, and then the actor model, which is isolated mutability. So yeah, that's these are all melodies, and uh, there are lots of stuff that is. We in fact we later on moved to what is called as everything is an event. So where we've used Rx. And uh, you can check the code on GitHub uh, as well. And uh, there is comparison of Rx with core async. So core async. core async, yeah. So we have implemented, basically we have closure stopped. Closure core async. Closure core async, yes. And we have implemented what is called as, uh, there is a ticking stock price. And you're supposed to do brokerage addition and runtime calculation of net worth and show it to the user as it kind of uh, goes up and down. So yeah, uh, it is there. Uh, you can go take a look. Yeah. So, so uh, one thing that stood out to me yeah. was uh, the like the contrast between um, the APL example and the other examples was uh, um, when we use the parallel operator, uh, the mechanics of it are implicit. Like we don't need to care about the mechanics. Whereas uh, out here, uh, um, whatever other examples you've seen, we have to explicitly like the programmer has to explicitly like think about the mechanics and then make that uh, choice, design choice in the code that they're writing every time. So can you kind of comment on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the origins of APL, of course, are, I mean, like functional programming, it's mathematics, but it's coming out of linear algebra rather than the category theory. And the really important thing for us when we design these features, and these are, these are very recent additions to APL just in the last few years, was that the parallel should, you know, I should be able to put that parallel operator in or take it out. And if, if the functions are pure, the functions that are invoked do not have side effects, there should be no change in your reasoning about what the program is doing. Um, so, you know, those parallels are essentially hints by the human to say, I think this is worth parallelizing. I know something about the quantity of data. Go parallel here. And I have to admit that this last step uh, which is an evolution because it allows you to control the chaining, feels to, I feel uncomfortable. I haven't learned to love it yet. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the subtext for that is, uh, I mean, when we are writing code, there's a, we are dealing with a complexity budget, and uh, 
uh, that always has to like stay in our head. And when we are making, uh, when we are uh, putting knobs and like all the like controls ourselves in our code base, then I think that complex city budget kind of explodes at some point. You know, so uh, in non-trivial examples, this might become, like you said, like composability problems arise, uh, uh, and uh, we don't really know uh, in running systems how that system will grow and evolve, and where what looks uh, like a problem that we parallelize right now uh, suddenly becomes concurrent. You know, the choke points kind of show themselves over a period of time. So, um, so I mean, the, the underlying question is where is it? Uh, where does the implicitness help and where does the explicitness help? Okay, this is purely my view. I think I think the cognitive overload is high. With implicit, there is no cognitive overload. So that that is a clear uh, distinction right there. But there's still a problem, right? So in APL, if you had a one million element array and you said go do this in parallel, and it created a million isolates and the, the you know started sending TCP sockets and things to control them. And green threads, it wouldn't work very well. I don't think there's any way to avoid the programmer knowing something about the hardware and the amount of data. Not for the next 50 years, anyway. I mean, we've been trying for 60 years without solving it yet, right? <laughs> it's a hard problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think, okay, so I think the... One minute left. Yeah, so... Uh, two minutes here. So... Um, if you have any other reflections to make, yeah, uh, we can be up to two minutes. So I'm curious about the Scala thing, which was slow. Uh, although things were happening in parallel, we had uh, seen you have made things parallel, but still they were slow. Was that was the compiler reason behind it, or some it's, runtime issue? We were compiling it, so yeah. it was just a joke and take it as a joke. Uh, <laughs> This this editor we are doing on the fly comp compilation and then running it, so it does take time. <coughs> Thank you. This is about the band in Scala. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.